be prepared for our next show. There's a buzz going on that it's going to be about a neat treat that's great to eat. Welcome to Around the Town with Marilyn Forbes. Today's show is going to be all about honey. Not just walking into a store and buying honey, but actual honey that's made right here in the area. So we're going to show you how to go from that to this. And we're going to learn all about it. Uh, we're going to learn from a, from a gentleman who's been doing it for many years. He's going to show us how he does it and maybe how some of you can actually get started up in your own backyard. So stay tuned. It's going to be a great show. Okay, now before we begin, I want to introduce you to Brian Grindle. Nice to see you today, Marilyn. Nice to be here. <laughs> thanks for thanks for coming on the show. Okay, now you have been doing bees for how long? Since 1995. Okay, and there's a fancy name for it. What is it called? An apiarist is a beekeeper. Okay. And this is our apiary here at the farm. Okay, now we are now, we're, we're at Sand Hill Berries in Mount Pleasant Township, and Brian has several hives here, and you also have some hives at home as well. Yes, at home and several other locations, actually, several other farms in the, the area, too. Okay, now before we get started here, just give us a brief rundown. How did you get started in this hobby? Actually, it's a good story. Uh, I've always been interested in farming, um, interested in starting a little orchard and k taking care of the crops that I have at home, the garden, and... Um, a friend of mine had a beekeeping supply catalog that I started to take a look at, got interested, um, mailed for that catalog, started to read everything I possibly could, and found out as much as I possibly could about beekeeping before I delved into it. But delving into it without a mentor is not the way to go. So anyone that's interested in that, you need to find someone locally uh, that can help you, or at least someone that, that um, can at least advise you to get started. But uh, after 16 years, we've we've done okay. And how did you, it's an interesting story, how you found your mentor. Yes, actually, several different uh, ways that, that, that um, you can go out and, and find a mentor. But one of the ways I did was it was through Armstrong Cable that I thought, well, I need to find a way to go out there and advertise for someone that I can get some equipment and someone to first talk to about bees. And Armstrong had the rotating uh, H-channel bulletin board at the time. And I put an ad on there looking for bee equipment and bee advice. And there was a Methodist minister in Scottsdale that was moving parishes and called. And he and I sat down and talked with his wife. I bought the equipment that he had. And um, that, that launched things actually for us. Okay, so now uh, tell us, start us at the beginning. This is some of your product here that you make. Yes, this is our honey. Um, we, we sell in, in several different jars. This is two pound by far is the most popular. If people are buying local honey, they're, they're using it in quantity uh, for a lot of different purposes, whether it be something just for sweetening their tea or um, using it for what I can't actually say medicinal purposes, but using it to relieve uh, the effects of allergies and the pollens in the air. We, we'll talk about that as we go through here. Um, we're actually doing some favors now in little two ounce Aww. bears, things like that. Um, we have some other product that are products of the hive over here too. Uh, we pour candles and make taper candles. I know Marilyn wants to take a smell of the actual oh. beeswax candle. Now what's the difference between that and a regular wax candle? A regular wax candle could be soy wax, um, which is um, a white wax typically and beeswax can be if it's if it's if it's uh, bleached and actually filtered completely through this is actually the natural color of the wax but oh. beeswax candles will not drip and and for really? years and years oh, and years since that. um for a long time churches required their candles uh, to you know, be just speaking of churches i wondered if that's what they use churches okay. required it to be they don't drip you don't get the big drips down alongside them and they burn pure um if you're buying paraffin candles obviously they're going to be a a petroleum-based candle, something that doesn't have quite the scent unless it's scented. These are not scented. There's nothing added to those candles. And then there's products like this, the little wax bars that we make. Um, people use them for doing a, a hinge or uh, we get quilters that run their needles through oh, them that okay. actually lubricate their needles in that I've way. I've heard of that. Is, is there a difference between the honey that you make and something I would buy like in a store? Well, a store's a store needs to have a product that stays on the shelf for okay. an extended period of time. Okay. Um, typically, commercial 
packers uh, for honey will heat that honey to um, above 140 degrees and that kills the spores that causes honey to crystallize. Now I know that when I was a kid, we would buy the little honey bear, uh, we would put it in the refrigerator, and after a period of time, that would all turn what everyone calls goes to sugar. It actually crystallizes. We would look at it and we would throw it away. But honey actually never, ever goes bad. It is hygroscopic, meaning that it, it absorbs uh, water. If you keep it sealed, it will stay. It has an indefinite shelf really? life. And all you need to do is take a warm pan of water, sit your honey bear or bottle in there. It will reliquify overnight, and it's as good oh, as it was the excellent. next day. that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that bee tip. That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> okay, now, where did you get your bees? How do you get started? That's another good question. There's a lot of different ways. Um, when I first started, I, I didn't know anyone actually that had bees. The, the person I originally talked to, he was obviously moving away, didn't have any hives at the time. So I had done some research and you could buy packaged bees of, of, of by the pound in the mail. And this is an actual mailer <laughs> for bees. You get bees in the mail. <laughs> yeah. And you order, we ordered these. Um, this was one of my original packages. And we got a three pound swarm, artificial swarm of bees that was in here. There's a a, a jar with sugar syrup in here that would feed them during their, their time in the mail. And then the queen is actually not the original queen for that swarm, so she needs to be caged so that her pheromones, her scent, uh, mixes through that and she'll eventually be accepted, hopefully, as the queen for those what, bees. There. What if she's not accepted? If she's not accepted, she's actually eliminated by the colony. And um, they, if they don't have eggs, um, they'll end up dying, so oh, you'll have gracious. to actually so get you another queen. Yeah, you, you, you have to call for another queen or and then she's the queen yeah, bee. manipulate <laughs> things to actually work. That's exactly right. <laughs> and it was always thought of that the queen bee was kind of a, uh, a prestigious thing to be, but more and more as we, we delve into beekeeping, we're, we're more learning that the, the queen is actually directed by the rest of the colony. Oh, um, so she's not calling she's the doing. shots then? No, no. Oh, she lays well, between 1,500 this time of year, height of the season, she's laying between 1,500 and 2,000 eggs per day. Oh, this is the height of the season? This, oh, this June, July, and August, okay. mid-August is the height of the season. And um, she's doing as much as she possibly can to maintain that colony to increase. Okay. Um, what happens though, at this, this is called swarm season also. Um, typically in this area, it's late up April until um, realistically till late June um, can be can be swarm season. And the way they reproduce their colonies is that once they become so co so congested that she's laid so many eggs for so long, um, they start to think that they're they're too congested. So what she does is she goes around and she sets new swarm cells, and the swarm cells actually. Um, look, the, the queen cells look like a peanut, the shelled peanut, oh, okay. actually. It looks different than the, the rest of the cells that hangs off near the bottom of the, the frames at that time. And the first queen that comes out will go around and sting and eliminate all of the other queens that she possibly can. So she becomes the sole um, parent of that, wow. that colony. And then the old queen, before that actually occurs, the old queen takes about half the bees and moves on. And we collect a lot of swarms for the Game Commission and for... Um, the conservation oh, office. You mean out in nature you guys yes, go out? Yes. Oh, that's cool. Many places I could show you here. Just recently we took five off of the, the berry farm oh. here where colonies that, um, that either mine or natural colonies swarmed okay. here. Okay, so now you get your bees in the mail. Yes. Hopefully they accept the queen. Yes. Then where do we go from there? Let's make a transition over okay. to this hive over here and I can kind of demonstrate. You would take this box this is just the really short version of it. You would take this box, you would take, there's a lawn cover on top of this, you would take your queen cage out, you would open up your colony here, you would sit your, your queen cage in between the frames, and we'll talk a, a minute once we get into the hives about what the frames look like and actually the purpose of why we have frames to keep bees. Um, the bees are then knocked to the bottom, they are dumped in, uh, they smell the queen, Hopefully they stay there. There are a lot of other manipulatives and tools in beekeeping, there's always some new gadget, but you could put a queen excluder on the front of it to keep her from flying out. Typically not necessary though. Um, you can spray this with sugar syrup to kind of keep them from flying from a period of time too. Um, closing that up, you can stuff grass in the front too to kind of slow things down so that nothing's coming in and out to start to rob them out. And after a period of time, they will accept her hopefully and you'll have a queen right colony that will begin to build comb, store nectar and pollen, and she'll begin to lay eggs. Wow. There.
Now, how long of a process does it take for them to go from just settling in to where they actually start to build? Oh, within days. Oh, actually, really? Absolutely, absolutely within okay. days. Actually, within days, I have this frame, and this is a Langstroth movable frame. Can I touch it? Yeah, actually okay. on this side, this is a solid core. This has a, a wax coating on the outside. What you can see though here is the actual cells being started. You can see how they actually stand oh, okay. up. Underneath the insect, the bee's exoskeleton are wax glands that when they have the need, they're well fed and they have the need for wax, they'll start to secrete these little flakes of, of wax out. And they actually take those just like Play-Doh and they manipulate them and they start to stack them up until you actually have the perfect shape of a bee cell. Oh, okay. Now, Interesting. just a couple things too. Okay. These look like all worker cells, which will, there's three different bees that would be in here. Okay. Um, the, the, these are all worker cell. We talked already about the queen cell, which would, um, there's supersedure cells, there's, there's different stages of that where they would replace that queen. But that cell looks kind of like a peanut. You'll only find a few of those, and hopefully if it's queen right, you're not finding any of those because you really don't want your, your bees to swarm if you're producing okay. honey. Um, then there's also another cell which is a little bit bigger, still the same shape, but a little bigger, and that's the drone cell. Workers are female. Workers have stingers. Workers do all the work in the colony. I know you'll find this funny. The females I do saw, all the I work saw, and I saw they the eye rolling. Huh. I saw the hmm. eye rolling. Okay. Now, now the, so the workers will actually, <laughs> the, work, the work, well, we'll talk about that. And I think you know the direction <laughs> okay. we're going to go there. But, but the workers actually, as soon as they're born, they begin to um, clean cells. They begin to nurse new bees. Oh, and there's okay. a transition, actually. During this time of the year, they're only going to live about six weeks. And the last couple weeks of their life is when they actually do their foraging. You'll see a bee that is old, a six-week-old bee now, where its wings are tattered. It's actually worked oh. itself to death. Oh, that's terrible. Now, let's talk about that other cell, which <laughs> is just a little bit bigger, typically sometimes just a little bit distorted, not always exactly true in shape, um, placed in some very weird locations, and those are the drones. And those drones, <laughs> those drones are actually the boy bees. The drones have no stingers at all. They actually... <laughs> obviously no sense of style no, or nothing. And they just kind of, it's kind of like being in the easy chair. Okay. You know, they, they literally, do not, they, they actually take nectar, they take things that they need to survive. They do fly out every once in a while. Um, you'll see them as we, we go through the hives, you'll see them there, but they serve only one purpose in the hive and that's for, thought to be the only purpose they, is for breeding. Um, and realistically, the queen breeds one time in her life and she'll breed with 15, 20, 20 different drones who lose their life after breeding. Oh my. Um, and the rest of the drones just live out their life hoping that you know they have what that life. chance. It, it is. It is. It is. Okay, and you said that now this is when when the queens start to really lay. How much? How many eggs can a, can a queen lay in her life? Did you? I don't know about lifetime, Marilyn. I'm, I really have to think about that one. But at this time of year, they live season yeah, there, there's season a cycle. Though. Yeah, there's okay. a cycle. Okay. This time of year, she starts to lay in January. Okay. Believe it or not, when there's still wow. snow in the ground, really? the queen will start to lay. She starts to ramp up knowing that when she comes into the season that there's enough bees there. Those bees have lived. Where the typical bee would live only six weeks, mm -hmm. that bee can live from October until February. Oh, okay. So it all depends about how hard they actually okay. work. But she'll start to lay in January. As the months progress, she starts to lay more and more. And then around September, October, her egg laying stops so that they actually prepare to, to, to cluster for winter, making sure that they have enough food stores for winter to survive. Okay, how long can a queen live? Thought to be at least five years. Really? Not, wow. Not viable a busy usually lady. for that, for that okay. kind of period of time typically. But um, the thought is in the beekeeping community now, though, is to requeen um, every possibly every year, maybe every two years, so that you're having strong colonies. Oh, okay, that makes sense, so, sure. Sure. Okay, so where do we go from here? We will talk. This past weekend, we did some queen rearing at Penn State University. We, there were 10 of us that were selected to do um, the first Pennsylvania Cold Climate Queen Rearing Workshop. And the thought is, for years and years, we bought our bees from Georgia. and. In buying the bees from Georgia, you were able to get your bees much earlier in the year, thinking that your bees would, would um, build up quicker earlier in okay. the spring, but they're not climatized, acc acclimated, I should say, to this environment. So now if we have cold climate queens, we are going to start a little later in the year, but they're actually able to survive, hopefully able to survive the winters. 
Um, this is actually a, a, a frame that's made for lifting, and I'll show you some eggs when we get into the, okay. the hives, that you actually take this out, and I'll pull this out, and I need a very, very good set of magnifying glasses. No, and you take an instrument that looks like a dental see. pick that you would lift the egg out, place in here, put it into a cell builder first. They would begin to build those peanut-shaped um, cells out. Just start them, and then you put it in a finisher, and they'll raise anywhere from 20, 30 queens to 40 queens um, oh, in one hive. And then okay. you would pull those cells off and, and you'd you be able a... to put them in to, to make splits to make new colonies. Oh, then, that's so. excellent. And these would already be acclimated because they were they were raised born here. Yeah, that's oh, exactly okay. right. That's exactly All right. right. Okay. So now where do we go? You can probably go into the hives if you'd like. Oh, we're ready to go in. Okay. We're gonna break for a second and we're gonna go in and learn up close and personal how to make honey. Okay, we're going in folks. I feel like a spice, space person here. Okay, now Brian applied a little bit of smoke um, before we came over. You want to explain that process to us real quickly? Yeah, actually when you smoke the bees um, in nature, if there are bees near, um, it would bees that live in the trees, if there's a fire nearby, um, their hive would be in danger. So their process of of leaving is to actually gorge themselves on a much, as much honey as they possibly can. Um, and then when they leave, they would have their honey stomachs filled with, with honey and they'd be able to build comb somewhere else and start a new hive in case that one would be eliminated. So the thought is that when you smoke them, some of those bees are going to actually stick their heads in the cells and start to gorge themselves on honey. So you have less of the population worrying about guarding themselves against you. So that's why we smoke them. And actually the process is, uh, typically you just smoke the entrance a little bit and you allow that smoke to waft through the entire colony, lift the, high, the cover a little bit, also do the same there. Now we can talk about the composition of the hive um, here, these box hives is what we all associate now with as being a beehive, but for a long time until the mid-1800s we didn't use a movable frame hive. Um, hives were kept in log gums, trees that were, were taken out of the, the woods. Um, it progressed into skeps, which we know is the woven basket style that we use for decoration to this, this, even to this time. Um, those hives, though, in order to capture or take the honey, rob the honey from those, those hives, you had to actually kill the bees. You had to smoke them. They would build a fire beside them, move that hive over, smoke them out, kill the bees, and they, they would crush and strain uh, that honey. Um, Reverend Lorenzo Langstroth actually recognized bee space that um, by observing bees that anything less than a quarter of an inch the bees will propolize or propolize and that's actually um, a, a, a black almost a, a sticky tarry like substance that they gather from the tree um, saps and from pine tree resins things like that and that's kind of what they glue their whole hive to, uh, uh, together with and they pack it in areas where there would be open spaces so they're protecting themselves from the cold or from predators anything in excess of a, a little over three eighths of an inch they actually build wax comb in so in his spacing as we go through these frames there's a, they're actually spaced so that they're not supposed to build a whole lot of comb or propolize uh, in between those. So it allowed the beekeepers to actually remove those frames, cut the wax cappings off, extract the honey, and we had liquid honey rather than and be able to give those combs back to the bees, which saved them a whole lot of work too. Okay. Now um, I'm going to back you up a little bit. Okay, now the bees, uh, first of all, why do you have the hives here in this location? Is it because of all the different plants or explain why they are where they are? Here we're standing in, in the current field. Uh, this is X, which is the, the blackberry field. And there's a lot of different blooms throughout the course of the year here at the berry farm. So the bees actually capture those, those okay. different. And that, that's important because during different times of the year, um, the, the honey that you take, um, reflects the type of flower that they're actually drawing the nectar from and the flavor of that honey will actually be um, it, it will be the same or similar to those those types of flowers too. Now wow. not necessarily if they're they're working apple flowers or apple blooms will the honey taste like apple but it will be a lighter more of a spring type okay. of flower. 
Um, one of the favorite honeys that um, we sell at Slope Hill Honey is, is the goldenrod aster honey, which is the fall flower. Everything that the ragweed that everyone complains about with their, their allergies is one of our, our, our most popular um, sellers because it has more of a butterscotch or a caramel type of a flavor oh, okay. to it too. Um, also, if you'd like to, we can talk about the, the pollens that are still inside. We talked earlier about why people would want to buy local honey. That's, that's one of the reasons too, is that we don't mm -hmm. pressure filter, we don't highly heat that, our honey. Um, and some of the pollens remain. Now, just as you go to get your flu shot uh, each year, you're getting a little bit of whatever that virus is injected into you, so your body has the ability to fight off of that, fight that, that virus off. And the, the thought process is there just that, um, is that if you're ingesting a little bit of those pollens that you're allergic to, that possibly your, your body would be able to, to fight those okay. off. Now, as we move into the hive here, you'll see that one box is a little bit less shallow, then we have two deep ones. Oh, these are, okay, I see there are two or deeper. Okay. These are our brood boxes. This is where they, they keep house. They, okay. they, they lay their eggs, they, they store their food. And here, this is called a honey super. All the boxes are actually called supers. Okay. Um, this is a honey super, and the honey super actually is a little more shallow. Um, the, the queen doesn't like to lay on the less shallow pattern. She will, but eventually she'll move down into the deeper frames. So that's where we would actually be taking our honey off of that, that smaller okay. box. Okay. As we move in, we're gonna get them, give them a little more smoke here because they're kind of used to us now. There's a thought that maybe we're domesticating bees like we have cows and horses, but I think that's almost impossible to do. They're always gonna be wild creatures. You can't have a pet bee then. No, no. <laughs> and I tell people I have millions of pets. Um, I'm not kidding, actually I do. We're going to take the honey super off and sit it to the side. And we'll pull some frames out here. Just It's great that the sun's behind us because we're going to be able to see a lot of what goes on in the hive in that way. Oh, boy. Ah. Now, this frame, Marilyn, has typically mostly um, not to be, mostly brood in it. All of these brown cappings would be brood. And this is the pattern. If you look, it's almost kind of a half moon shape okay, is the way that they that. lay. This would be for brood rearing here. Notice we see those drone cells down here. They have kind of a bullet shape to them, not a flat uh, capping like the, no, the, the actual okay. worker would be. Then there's typically a band of pollen. And if you look really deep, and I'm, I'm going to hold this for you to be able to see, Meryl. If you look deep, you can see that pollen reflect out. Oh, you see okay. it's bright orange. The bright actually. orange there, sure. And that's the pollens from the flowers that are burnt, that are actually blooming or have been blooming here um, just recently. And then there's a band of food, a band of honey that's on the outside. And I'm going to, to break this open just a little bit so you can see, actually. Ooh, there it is. And that's the honey. Actually, now that's, oh, that's this is neat. actually what they use for rearing their brood. They mix the honey with the pollen. It makes a bee bread, and that's what they feed to their young bees too. Oh, okay. And you can see this this honey looks dark, but as we put it on, it's a fairly light color sure. spring honey that we have in this one. I'm going to slide this one back in. Hopefully, we're not smashing too many bees, which is what we're trying to keep from doing. Run, little bees, or fly. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now. Peak season, Marilyn, um, this kind of a colony will have between 60 and 80,000 bees in. Oh my goodness. All at one time, you mean? I mean All at one time. Oh my goodness. All at one time, so they... They're, they're busy bees. <laughs> yeah, a bee's lifetime, she'll make about one-tenth of one teaspoon of honey, which you know oh takes goodness. a lot of bees to make that happen. Now this frame I've picked, has not been capped yet. Some of the honey has been capped over here. You can see that there's nectar inside here. Um, it's almost, I'm gonna- This is the ooh, orange again? Down. No. Oh, okay. I'm here, look, do you see the reflecting I almost see. like water okay. in there? That's right. just nectar is what that is. Okay. It is, hasn't been dried yet. Nectar is just, um, honey is actually dehydrated nectar. Uh, it gets to 18% or below, it's classified as honey at that point, and it will store better. We also see that pollen again, but what I really want you to see, Marilyn, is the young larva. If we hold this to the sun, if you look in these cells in here, you'll see the little tiny larva 
on the bottom of the cells. And if you look out here, you'll just see almost a real, like a, a, a period, a dot at the bottom of the cells, that's the eggs. Oh, wow. Very small, very small. So this is a fresh frame of, of brood that's just being laid, just being reared. Eventually, this frame will, will be like capped just like okay. that other one. Okay. This side, also the same. You can see the, the nectar not yet dried. Uh, they, they fan, they keep the inside of the hive warm. They dehydrate that, that nectar to the point that it does become honey. Let's look at Maybe we can see. Yeah. We can pick that up. See. The nectar up here. It's the nectar. Correct. Nectar would be. You see it reflecting as a liquid in these cells here. I'm going to spin this around again. There's some really nice. The, the, the sunlight does justice to the pollen. It almost turns. It almost becomes iridescent when when you see it in the sunlight. But here you see the capped honey. Over here we have some nectar. And in here is all larvae and eggs at different stages of their life. An egg, um, after the third day, it, it lays down, uh, begins to grow as a larva. That's a, that's a ha that, that egg has hatched into a larva. Um, workers take 21 days to, to develop from the egg state till the point that they're actually um, a working uh, bee. Queens are 16 days. And the drones, they get a little extra time in bed. They're 24 days, actually. So. And they do the least. They do. They do. They're a little bigger, though. And actually, if you give me just one second here, I can point out probably. The drones are the ones in the easy chairs at the bottom doing nothing. Oh. We're going to take a Why glove. No, just bump back in. I have one drone there that I wanted to pull out. Right there. Is that one? No. Nope. No. We're going to pull a drone off a frame here just to show you. Okay. Now, to say we could go through and find the, the queen may take a long process. Yeah, this is a drone. We're not hurting him. I just grabbed him by the wing. Um, the drone is much bigger than the other the other bees there. They don't have a stinger. Um, they fold up just like they would in flight when they I mate. See that. Look how neat uh -huh. that is. They fold up in flight just like they would in are fuzzy. The the pollen <laughs> the, the pollen is actually um, almost an incidental thing. They do need it to rear their 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 young, but they have all of these hair fibers, follicles on the outside, and as they move from flower to flower, it actually gathers on there. Now, the drone doesn't gather that. The, the workers have the, hunt, the pollen baskets on their back legs that they pack that, that into. Okay. I'll let them go. Be free. Be just fine. Be free. <laughs> Be free. He doesn't. He wants to go back, well, back to the lounge chair. On a... We'll take him back in here. He's getting stuck in, honey. Okay. And I'll tell you what, Meryl, we've, we've gone through the process here. This is a, this is a, 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 a docile hive. Typically, okay. well, um, in another, another month or so, <laughs> when things are, are, are much more busy, um, there's not as many flowers in bloom, they'll be much more aggressive because they're looking for flowers oh, probably okay. further distances out. Um, typically, the flight pattern is about a two-mile radius uh, for bees during the course of a day, so they will go out. But in arid regions, they'll go out as much as 15 miles to find oh, wow. food and bring it back. So it depends what your climate is. Um, everyone wants to know also about the killer bees, mm -hmm. uh, the Africanized uh, bees, and we have those in the United States. Um, they're in the Southwest, they're in Florida, and eventually someday it may be something we have to all um, live with. But um, to this point, we have not had them that actually, they've been in, brought in with pollinators here in the, into Pennsylvania, but not actually any colonies that have been found. You know that, that bees also, when, when Columbus came, bees weren't here in the Americas. Um, the pilgrims actually brought some of the first honeybees. They weren't native to the Americas. And the progression of the, the, the building of um, the civilization in the United States and in, in the Americas actually coincided with the progression of the bees moving westward also. Really? Yeah. These strains that we have are European strains, um, mostly uh, some of the, the, the German black bees, different strains that were brought here first, weren't very successful 
um, I shouldn't say just the Germans, German black bees, but other bees were brought here. Then the Italian strains were brought and they wintered well here. Uh, they, they make a lot of honey. And most of the bees that we have here are, are strains or variations of the Italians, but there are so many other different Russian hybrids now and Carnolians and Buckfasts and many different on and bees. On. Yeah, many different bees. Now, I hope I'm not jumping ahead. No, not at all. Go ahead. How do we get honey from this? No, that we, we would take, now I've just put, in order for these to be a little bit calmer. Okay. We would take this frame, and these are, these are just freshly put on honey supers. No caps, probably very little, if any, nectar. I'm going to pull a good frame out that they haven't, and there shouldn't be any bees, should be good for us to talk about. Yeah, there we go. Yep. One is fairly flat. Yep, there we go. Now this is a comb, um, honeycomb that it's, it's empty currently. And what I've done uh, the last time that I extracted honey, this was completely full of honey and had those cells on that we saw completely, completely from one end to another. I take this home, I take a, a hot knife actually, a warmed knife that's electric knife, and I run that knife over the entire frame. It takes the cappings off. When the cappings come off, then you put it in, it's a centrifuge type of a, and it, it looks like an oversized washing machine, stainless steel washing machine. But you stack those in there, you turn it on, and it actually flails the honey out of those those cells to the outside and then it's liquid honey. What's nice about that, Marilyn, is before we had the centrifuge, before we had extracted honey, this was crushed and then strained. What I can do now is, is this takes a lot of work. It's the ratio is seven to one, eight to one. I've heard nine to one as to what it takes to make wax compared to what it takes to make a pound of honey. So what is, what's nice though is I can put this back on the hive and they can begin to, to, to fill it with nectar right away without having to build the, the cell back out again too. So the extracting process for liquid honey is, is, is a, a much better process for the bees actually. Okay. Instead of the crush and strain. Put that back in. I'll tell you, I'm gonna replace this box. Marilyn, it's okay. going to be your turn. Oh, okay. We're gonna pick a hive up here for you to actually go in and take a look and see what you can find. Be as nice to the bees as we can be. Close things back up. Okay, now something else that we had talked about before with, with beekeeping is actually you don't really need a large space to do this, correct? No, you don't. No, you don't. I'm going to do a little incidental lesson here, Marilyn, with you about a sting because I just received one. And, um, if you'd like to see the sting a little bit closer, a lot of people say, oh, does the bee die when it stings you? Yes, it eventually does. This stinger here, um, if, if you could see real closely, you'll see that the stinger is actually still pulsing. Behind that stinger is a venom sac. It's a little bulbous thing that the venom is actually in. There's some nerves attached to that, and there were actually some of the bee's entrails attached to that too. So she literally, you know, kind of tears her guts out when, when she stings you too. But that, that group of nerves continues to pump that venom into your skin. What you should never do, and I know as children, we all ran around with in our bare feet yep. and oh, the white yeah. Dutch clover in the, many, many the summertime sting. that we sat down and, and tried to grab it and pull it out. That bulb is kind of like a syringe, that if I were to go this way, squeeze it, and try to pull it out, I will inject all of that venom into my skin oh. immediately. So what you should do is take a credit card or a fingernail and scratch it out, and then you still have, and you can see that we've, we've actually pushed the, when we, we smushed it this way, but um, that way, that still hurts. It does. It's it's still not a um, easy process. But you don't but get as much stuff. No, you don't okay. get as much much venom in okay. in you Thank when you. you do that. that that's for a that, for that little, little that little tip, bee hint. Little bee tip. Berg's Bees is the organization that is promoting hobby beekeepers in urban areas. Oh, okay. uh, they're actually keeping a few hives at the Pittsburgh Zoo now. Um, and that's the direction now with um, the problems that we have in the beekeeping industry. Realistically, since the 20, since for the last 20 years, since the late 1980s, um, new 
problems have been brought into the United States. It first started with a trachea mite, which is a mite that goes inside of the bee's trachea and feeds on the lymph glands. And as they multiply and reproduce, um, it, it suffocates the bee. Um, then became varroa mite, and people lost thousands and thousands of colonies in that way. And people got mm. frustrated. The backyard mm -hmm. beekeeper really got frustrated because all of a sudden people were putting medications in their hives. Um, the problem lately has been, and bees have been in the news a lot lately, has been CCD, colony collapse disorder. Mm -hmm. And the thought is there that um, bees are loaded on the backs of trucks. The, the almond groves in late January and February, they need, in California, they really need pollinating insects. And those bees are, are, are hauled across the country, uh, wears just as would, would with us, it wears that bee down. Uh, some of the new no, apis, or Nozema, which is a spore-borne uh, disease, which we've always had, uh, Nozema apis, but it, it causes a dysentery type of reaction in the bee, but now we have Nozema uh, serrana, which it's different. It actually weakens the, the immune system too. Um, all of those things are culminating to, to really weaken the bees. So with that kind of publicity, more people have become interested in bees and want to get more involved and see how they can, they can actually help. So those backyard beekeepers, those people as hobby beekeepers are important to, to our communities. And people like Berg's Bees and there are other organizations I belong to, um, the Westmoreland County Beekeepers Association here and the State Beekeepers Association. And, and we're getting an influx of a lot more newer, younger bees beekeepers, which, which is, is good for the community it, it, and good for our environment. It's yeah. said that in some way, 80% of our food can be connected back to a pollinating insect, wow. whether it's we think about the fruits and the vegetables, but also we need to think about our beef. Where does the food for it come from? The, 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 the alfalfa grasses and things that need to be pollinated, um, just like um, the things that we eat. So in some way, 80% of the food is connected to pollinating insects. In bees, it said, well, there's other wasps and things like like that, but none that have the concentration that bees have. The other nests aren't as, as concentrated. So that, that's really good to know because I think a lot of people are under the impression that you need acreage like you, that we're here. There are bees that, being kept in, in I know in New York, York City, City. yeah. That, the oh, there's little, the little garden top yeah, uh, gardens exactly. they have. Kept and out on their balconies. Yeah, that's excellent. In the, in the air that it um, pollinate Central Park for those, yeah. those people there. So yeah, you don't have to have, and there actually are some really neat um, setups now where you can buy a really nice little cedar hive with a copper top and oh you know, be very decorative in oh, your, your very, yard very too. Very fashion so conscious can, bee yeah, hives. You can, okay. you can be environmentally <laughs> friendly and very fashion there conscious. There you go. So uh, fashion police here. won't arrest you then. So. Okay, we're ready. Okay, let's move down to the next hive. Okay. And it's going to be Marilyn Stern. Where are we heading? I'm following you. Oh no, oh. this one down there. You got bee fuddled. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to allow you to do the smoking, Marilyn. Okay. So you'll just pick, I'll hold your... There you your, go. You'll yes, hold that? Yes. So I don't get... Okay. And a little bit in here as well. Yeah, let's lift up and do that. And you just kind of let that waft through the hive a little bit. The movement of their wings and um, the vibration in her body kind of moved that smoke through a lot, just like it does with the pheromones from the queen and the sense from the, the, the drones also. I'll take this top box off for you. And what you'll do, Marilyn, is you'll just go into there and crack this out of the Perfect. Now, this hive is, needs a little smoke. Go ahead and smoke the tops a little bit just because they're coming off the, the frames a little bit at us. Just like this? Yep. Right down in between. That's great. Perfect. Ooh, they really start buzzing. Yeah, they do. That's good. I like the way you smoke, Marilyn. You do a good job with that. <laughs> I'd be your assistant. We're going to pull a couple of these frames apart here. And what you'll do is just get underneath here and lift the frame up a little bit. Here? Yep. And then we'll grab. You can sit your hive tool down. Just sit it right here on top. And I want you to grab that here. And this one. Okay. Woohoo! 
it is a little unnerving. I got to tell you, the first time I placed, placed a package of bees in a colony, it is a little unnerving because you have thousands of stinging insects. Now, this is a great frame here because you do have pollen that's in here. You have a nice band of, we'll just crack that open a little bit, Marilyn, to show. We have a nice band of honey. They'll repair that within a few hours, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, it doesn't take long. Some of the cell, we were doing cell building this past weekend, and we would actually just break the um, cells down, put a big notch in them. The next day, it looked like we were never even there. So they work very fast. They're, they're very prolific. They're very busy bees. They sure are very busy bees. <laughs> That's a good one. Put let's, yeah, let's put that one back in. Bye, guys. Just nice and easy. There's a big drone coming out to see you. Doing a little girl watching. It's good. Okay? Yep, perfect. I'm pretty occupied. It's good. Good. Let's pull this one out. This one? Mm hmm. This one. You need to be able to see if you can see eggs or larvae on this one. Mm -hmm. I think this is a good one for that. Okay, now Marilyn, what I want you to do is I want you to flip that up and backward like this into the light. So, so now what are you yes. seeing there? I'm seeing a lot of liquid. A lot like. of liquid. Mm -hmm. Now turn it upside down. Just kind of flip it upside, mm -hmm. that's it. Flip it upside down this yeah, way. Yeah, just like that. Now face it a little bit into the sun. Oh, okay. Tell me if you can see anything other than nectar. I see orange stuff. I see orange stuff also. And what does that mean? I forgot pollen. already. Okay. That's pollen. You can see any. Can we see any bebes? Yeah. In here. Take a look real deep in. You'll see just. Oh, I it's do. Like a tiny, I see. I see. Tiny that. little grain of, yep. of, of rice, and you'll see eggs that are being laid in there. It's amazing. It is amazing. Okay. We're putting these bebes back. Yes, we can. Okay. You do good work. Thank you. <laughs> See, that, that, that's, that's, that's a great opportunity to show how easy it actually is yep. because it, it's not it. really that hard to actually, once the bees do, because bees do most of the work, um, other than the heavy lifting and things like that, that any backyard beekeeper can actually um, become very good and actually be productive and, and be very helpful to the entire environment and their local community. Now, we're going to push these back together. These little tabs or ears is what I was talking about that actually keep the frame spaced oh, okay. exactly the exactly. same distance right. apart for the that. most part. Okay. Um, I run nine frames in my, my honey supers because I get nice big fat combs to cut the, the cappings okay. off of. But I'm sure you have that. But but um, it, it's it's called the, the Langstroth. There's a lot of variations on it. There are leaf hives in Europe. There's a lot of different um, styles of the hives. Um, believe it or not, Marilyn, um, beekeeping has been an interest to man ever since man has been here. It first started as honey gatherers with people mm -hmm. with tribes and still in, in, in Africa there are still tribes that there's mm -hmm. one person in that tribe that's actually mm -hmm. the that's honey gatherer, they that they go out and do hunts for bee trees and they gather nectar in that way. Um, that's the brave one, right? Yeah. <laughs> there, there have been more books published. Oh my gosh, I'm falling down a hill. The okay. only other topic um, that more books have been published other than beekeeping, believe it or not, is religion. Religion obviously really? is the most published topic, but beekeeping is the second most published topic ever. Uh, and, and it's something that man's always been interested in. Well, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, we're going to close this one up. Okay, well, we're going to close this one up. This just goes to show you, with a little bit of initial investment, yes, yes. and a lot of knowledge, I guess. It takes, it takes, it, it takes experience and practice is what sure. it takes. And a mentor, like you said, it's good yeah, to have that's someone. Best. That's best. And I understand there's, there's, I know that the the county fairs they do some yeah, um, we, in, in Westmoreland County Beekeepers Association. They're all that we always have mentors there. They did uh, really good informational displays there they too. They do, they do, and the, and the Penn State Beekeepers Association does a, a great job. It's a great organization. That's um, Southwestern Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania isn't as, as um, bee populated with, with beekeepers, but central Pennsylvania, Penn State's kind of the epicenter right now for beekeeping all over the country. But um, we go further north or we go further east, um, there's much more, many more beekeepers there. 
Well, so there you have it. You can be a beekeeper. A little bit of investment, and really, you just need a little bit of space, and you can have your own honey. You sure can. Right? Okay. Sure can. Brian, thank you. Thank you. Say goodbye to the bees. Well, folks, there you have it. We learned a lot about honeybees and how honey is produced. And you also learned, too, that it's really not that hard to have one of these beehives in your own backyard. And actually, the more hives we have, the more we'd help the environment. Well, that's it for today's episode. And remember, keep happy, keep healthy, and keep watching. Your family, friends, and neighbors are featured on Armstrong Local Programming. Meet fascinating people, visit new places, enjoy special events. Armstrong has our community like no one else. Hometown favorites are available on demand with your television plus subscription. Or find a complete program schedule at armstrongonewire.com. Local programming, exclusively from Armstrong. One Wire, infinite possibilities.